Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to Episode 294 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group is a business advisory, information services, and technology firm that helps corporations, financial institutions, governments, and SMEs manage their integrity and compliance risks in their businesses and in their third parties. You can find out more information on the Red Flag Group by checking out their website, www.redflaggroup.com. Today, I have with me Chris Tomlinson. Chris is the business columnist for the Houston Chronicle. Chris has worked in the journalism industry for many years, and he uh, worked overseas uh, for the Associated Press for about uh, 15 years. And I talked to Chris about what he saw as the effects of corruption in countries in Africa in his work as a journalist. This is both <clears throat> the story of corruption, but it's also the day-to-day impact of corruption on the citizens of those countries and how, how all of that works into uh, a law such as the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Chris also talks about how as a journalist, he would cover corruption trials, both in Africa and any FCPA case that might arise in the United States from an overseas perspective. The episode comes in at uh, just over 20 minutes. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, I have a real treat for you because we're in for a little bit uh, something a little bit different. I have Chris Tomlinson. Chris is the business columnist for the Houston Chronicle. Chris and I were recently on a panel together where he talked about how a journalist might cover a corruption trial in the United States, uh, but also internationally. Uh, I didn't know it uh, until I'd researched Chris's background for the panel, but he has extensive experience uh, reporting and working overseas, and he has seen the effects of corruption firsthand uh, particularly in the in the journalist industry or journalist profession, I should say, but he uh, and he had some really interesting um, stories about how corruption overseas or in uh, countries prone to corruption really impacts the day to day lives of people. So I asked him if he might be able to take time out from his uh, very busy schedule and visit with us, and uh, he has graciously agreed to do so. So Chris, with that introduction, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Chris, could you give, uh, uh, I introduced you as the business columnist of the Chronicle, but could you give our listeners a little bit of background of your professional career? Sure. I, uh, I've spent most of my career as a foreign correspondent, uh, specializing in uh, developing countries, uh, countries in conflict. Uh, my first job was as an, as an assistant to a reporter for the Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun covering the end of apartheid in South Africa. I lived in Rwanda for two and a half years where I reported for uh, the Associated Press and Voice of America on uh, post-genocide Rwanda, um, coup in Burundi, revolution in uh, Zaire, now called Congo. Uh, I also spent seven years as the uh, Nairobi bureau chief for the Associated Press where I supervised coverage of 14 countries uh, by 50 report by 50 reporters in 14 countries in Africa. So one of the things that really intrigued me about part of your story was uh, you've seen the effects of corruption even in the journalist journalist profession and how it, it, it impacted not only the people that worked for you and the people that work with you, but actually you had to um, deal with some of the consequences. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk about uh, times you had to help uh, people who work for you out or stringers who might have gotten uh, uh, in trouble in some way or, or in, in th- they just uh, uh, were forced to pay a bribe for some reason that here in the United States we might not understand. Well, I think it's important to know that, you know, when you're working in a country where poverty is endemic, uh, where you often have extreme uh Differences between, uh, say, you know, the, the wealthy and the poor with almost no middle class that, you know, people who are living on a dollar a day uh, will do just about anything they can to get up to a dollar fifty a day. And in that way, um, people will um, what you know, what we call corruption, what we get up, what we get upset about, we find offensive 
are, are things that they take as just normal practice. And I, uh, you know, I think about a lot of the local journalists uh, who work for local newspapers or more often for a local radio station, uh, because radio is a far more powerful medium in Africa than newspapers. Um, they got paid very little. Um, so little that they didn't own a car. They didn't have a method of transportation. So if the United Nations or a, uh, an aid group wanted local journalists to come, uh, they would have to pay for the transportation. Um, they would often find that if they put on a luncheon, uh, twice as many people would turn up uh, as if they didn't offer lunch. Uh, to the journalist, it was all about, you know, trying to get, you know, trying to cover the expenses of their work because they're not really paid enough to get it. Um, and that has often translated in this idea, am I paying for a story? Because those are things that we would find completely unacceptable in the United States. Um, you know, we don't, at the at mainstream newspapers, we don't expect people to pay for our transportation or to feed us in return for a story. Um, and... Oftentimes when you're dealing with uh, government officials, particularly low level government officials, um, you know, they've got that job not for the salary because the salary is almost nothing. Uh, they have that job so that they can demand bribes. Uh, it's, it's expected that they will demand bribes because they know full well that all the way up the chain of command, the people above them are also demanding bribes. So, you know, we used to, you know, I, in my expense reports in the 19, in the 1990s, uh, I would list, uh, facilitation, uh, for the $20 that I paid a, uh, a, uh, border guard to, uh, to let me into a country or to grant me a, or the $25 I would have to bribe someone to get a permission to be a journalist working in that country. And, um, and it happened to a lot of my reporters as well. So it's really not the, the situation where a government official is really um, trying to hold up a licensing process or some other business process uh, until he, he or she would get a bribe. It is more in the, the day-to-day, everyday routine activity of low-level low functionaries that as a part of their compensation – it's, it's expected that these small payments be made. Is, did I understand that correctly? Well, yes, and it, it's, it's obviously not official, uh, I mean, in most countries. I mean, Mobutu Sissiseko, who used to be a dictator who controlled Zaire, he famously told uh, a group of soldiers who were uh, mutinying because he hadn't paid them in a year, you know, I've given you a uniform, I've given you a rifle. If you don't know how to pay yourself, then I can't help you. Um, and so when a civil servant, you know, wants more money uh, or they're, they feel like they're not getting paid enough, they look at their boss who is holding up licenses, who is uh, holding up, um, you know, bigger financial deals. They're holding up the uh, foreign companies and demanding payment from foreign companies. They look at that boss. They see their boss collecting that money. And it's understood that they need to follow suit. And that's why... I say that when a large corporation pays a senior minister or a president a, a, a bribe or a compensation, it sets an example that will, you know, cascade all the way through the ranks down to the lowest traffic cop. And Chris, that's where I would see a law like the FCPA actually mattering or perhaps making a difference is not the right phrase, but communicating to U.S. companies that you have a role in this, this entire endemic or systemic corruption, and your role is the supplier of the money. And if you don't supply that money, perhaps that might lead to a change. Would, would that be fair? Absolutely. Um, you know, that was, you know, the activists who fought for laws like FCPA, you know, the folks, you know, the aid workers, Oxfam, uh, development workers, people who were in those countries trying to build real economies, trying to uh, get, you know, 
to establish taxation systems that would generate civil service salaries that wouldn't require the civil servants to take bribes. Um, you know, none of that will work if a foreign company, you know, or if a U.S. firm will come in and write a million dollar check to a senior government minister or bring a suitcase of cash. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the apocryphal stories and, you know, in, in Kenya was the uh, was the was the closet or, or the room in the Kenyan presidential palace that was full of leather briefcases that had been brought full of cash to give the president who took the cash out and would just throw the briefcase into a room. And apparently there was a room stacked with briefcases <laughs> from all the cash he'd received. You know, uh, you're not going to, you know, when everyone hears that story and everyone knows that's how it works, it's really hard to convince someone to do an honest day's work for an honest day's labor. When, when the tone at the top is such that uh, there's a, a briefcase room full of, not full, but empty briefcases. Exactly. Chris, if I could switch the uh, so focus a little bit. Um, at the, um, the panel we were on, uh, you and other panelists were discussing how journalists might cover a uh, corruption trial or an FCPA trial in the United States um, that uh, had a foreign component where the bribe was actually paid in a country outside the U.S., but the trial against the U.S. company was in the United States. And one of the things I was very intrigued about your remarks is that, that you said your company would have really covered it if it was a large enough trial, uh, uh, not so much from start to finish, but across the board, meaning that there would be a reporter assigned in Houston, there would be uh, reporters in country where the bribes uh, had been paid, and that, that there would be just a... Um, a very all-encompassing coverage from the bribe payer's home to the bribe receiver's home. Could you describe that journalistic process that would have been used? Sure. Um, you know, one of the most important roles of journalists in any society, and particularly American society, is the watchdog role that we play. Um, it is our job to kind of ferret out malfeasance. And to report on malfeasance and, and to, to demand a, uh, you know, a fair society. So, you know, when I get, you know, when I see a U.S. corporation, you know, lists on, you know, issue an 8K saying, you know, we've been informed by the uh, SEC or we've been informed by the FBI or whoever, that they're launching a corruption investigation against us. You know, that's, you know, that's people with power and privilege behaving badly. And that's the that's the nuts. I mean, that's the nuts and bolts of the uh, journalism business. So, yes, you know, when you're talking about an international news organization like the Associated Press or um, or, you know, the um, BBC or Reuters or any of them, uh, you know, that's a chance for us to really shine uh, for our clients. You know the, uh, you know for the for the newspapers uh, that that take the AP and that take Reuters like the Chronicle does. Um, so we'll have a reporter, you know, in the courtroom if the trial's going on, reporting on every word uttered. We'll have a reporter in the foreign country where the bribes took place, doing investigative reporting, finding as many people as they can who are willing to talk about it. Or if nothing else, just kind of laying out what I explained about how corruption spreads within a society, cripples it, deforms it, and makes and makes it impossible for that country to actually have a healthy economy that will float all boats. Um, that kind of layered reporting from different locations on the same story um, is is how an international news organization proves its value. It's how uh, that organization will win prizes and win esteem. So, um, you know, in a perfect world, uh, we would report on the corruption first, and then we'd see the U.S. authority get involved. But if we see a trial going forward, um, that's the second best opportunity. Would uh, the audience or your clients in uh, a country outside the United States be interested in the U.S. part of it, the U.S. trial as well? Absolutely, because 
you know, I know American business people that go into those countries and when they're in contract negotiations and the hint of a bribe comes up, you know, the honest American business person will say, I, hey, I've got the FCPA, you know, and I can't do that. And that African uh, government leader will reply, why not? I, you know, can't you pay a bribe back home to make sure that doesn't happen? You know, they're, you know, they, they, these African leaders will, you know, they don't always believe that corruption isn't just as endemic in America as it is in their country. And so uh, local newspapers have this, you know, local African newspapers, for instance, also take the AP. They also take Reuters. Um, and that would be a huge front page story for them if uh, there was an American company being prosecuted for corruption um, particularly if it's if that corruption took place in Africa, and that would be something they would follow very closely. So, with um, you moving back uh, to the United States and going to work, um, uh, certainly here uh, with the Chronicle in Houston, it seems to me you've continued uh, really this mission of journalism to uh, to report on malfeasance. Is that something that uh, you do? E- you feel you, you is your charge to do equally as much here as the Chronicle as you did at some of the other countries you worked in? Absolutely. I mean, my role as a columnist is to is to critique. I, I compare it to being a movie critic, you know, and I try hard to write positive critiques of companies that are doing good things and innovative things. Um, but the core of my job is to um, lift up, kick over some rocks, and if there's bad things happening, uh, to point them out. Um, you know, this this sounds strange, but I'm I you know because people don't think it's true, but you know, as a journalist, I'm a firm believer in capitalism, and when you have corruption and you have malfeasance, it distorts the market, distorts prices, um, and causes all kinds of havoc and and pain for someone eventually. So yes, I, I think it's, uh, it's just as we take politicians to task, we also have to take businesses to task. And I find that odd. You say that because of all your columns, I would have never in a million years said that you were not a capitalist. That seems to me to be one of the clear uh, and strongest messages I get that you believe in capitalism, but you believe in capitalism being done, uh, if not right, certainly fairly for everyone. So uh, that's really interesting uh, that uh, you. Well, I think a lot of I think a lot of people a lot of people you know I get a lot of emails talking about what a liberal socialist I am (laughs) and uh, and you know the rap on journalists is that they're um, that they're liberals and they're socialists and you know they hate big business um, and you know we hate politicians as well uh, because we critique them but you know I think. Certainly at the Houston Chronicle, certainly at the AP, uh, you know, our critiques are based on wanting fair play. And, you know, if it's your industry that we're attacking or your company, it may not feel like that. But that that is our motivating uh, raison d'etre. And I've always felt that in the the fight against corruption, certainly people like myself and lawyers have roles. There's a law that companies have to comply with. Companies have a role, and, and indeed the fourth estate has a role. And you've really articulated what I believe the fourth estate's role is, is to critique and to point out when uh, missteps are made. Right. And, you know, I think one of the things we discussed at the conference is why don't more companies go to trial in an FCPA case? Um, you know, why do they settle? Why do they, uh, why, why do they uh, sign agreements in which they promise to do better rather than uh, challenge the government's uh, evidence? And, and clearly, I think, um, I think the reason they don't is because they don't want that attention. Um, I know a lot of it's, it's a, I'm actually saddened by the fact that I know many great business people and many great businesses that have an absolute, you know, never talk to the press, never be in the press policy. Uh, Cause I'd like to write nice things about them uh, if they'd let me, but 
Um, but I, yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think, uh, certainly you get the wrong, wrong kind of limelight and, uh, and it can be damaging. Even if you end up winning your case, um, you know, the reporting can do as much damage as if you've lost. Well, Chris, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. And in, in my own selfish way, I could have talked to you the rest of the afternoon. But I know you have to uh, go rotate off so you can uh, work on a few other things. So I just wanted to uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, is your column up twice a week? Is Did I get that right? Right. So um, I have a column uh, that appears every Wednesday and Sunday at the top of the business page. And then five days a week, I write a uh, blog post, uh, a a blog called Outside the Boardroom. Occasionally, those blog posts will show up in the newspaper, uh, but they're shorter, a little more concise, more off, more playing off the news. But the the big reported columns are, are every Wednesday and Sunday in the Houston Chronicle. Well, Chris, we're really lucky to have you in Houston. You continue the uh, tradition of uh, great business journalism in this city. And I, I, I for one, uh, can't wait uh, each Wednesday and Sunday to read your column. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you again for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I have two requests for you. The first one is, if you've listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate this podcast. It would help on our rankings. The second is, if you have any questions you'd like answered in a mailbag episode, I'm developing my next one. So please shoot me an email at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report.